We're going to start this week by taking a look at Stan and R Stan ARM, and then thinking about how we can impl implement priors in Bayesian models. So just as a refresher and a bit of background, uh, in Bayesian data analysis, the thing we're trying to do is attempt to quantify our uncertainty about the parameter values in our model. And we represent parameter values just with this data that just represents some ambiguous set of parameters for whatever model we're interested in. And so we want to estimate our uncertainty given some data that we've collected. And we term this with this probability function, p theta given data. And theoretically, we do this by making use of Bayes' formula, which you see down here. And we're not going to get too, too into detail about Bayes' formula, but we will start out by talking a little bit about it, just and how it builds on some of the things that we've learned. So in Bayes' formula, there are two elements that are relatively straightforward and easy to handle. These are the likelihood function, which is this p data given theta part. So this is in the part of the numerator. And we've actually been dealing with this all semester in LME4. This is the likelihood function. Uh, LME4 and all maximum likelihood procedures make use of this uh, exact same fun uh, probability function in their estimation process. The new part that we have is this prior, which is just the p theta. And this is also, Conceptually straightforward, it's just a representation of our beliefs about what the parameters might be before seeing the data. And it can serve some other practical purposes too, as we're going to see. So these are pretty easy. The third element of Bayes' formula is the denominator, which is p data. And really, this is just how we scale the numerator to be a true probability. Um, so we really just want the denominator to be the sum of all possible elements of the numerator. So any single element of the numerator is just something bounded by zero and one. And so conceptually, we could just sum up all the possible numerators and put that in the denominator, and that would be the same thing as p data. So the problem is that when we're dealing with continuous variables and continuous probability distributions, the integrals needed to solve this equation are really hard, um, and they're often not even doable for a computer uh, just analytically. Um, which just means the computer can't compute them just, just using numbers. Uh, they need some kind of help. And that's why we have this process called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. This is a simulation-based process. And what it's essentially doing is it's drawing single proposed parameter values at a time from the distribution implied by the prior and the likelihood. And ideally, if the algorithm converges, it's just going to start drawing single parameters that represent this entire probability distribution. And as it draws over and over again, um, it continues to more precisely estimate the entire distribution. Um, so if you have 4,000 draws, which is the default in the MCMC programs we're going to look at, that means we have 4,000 data points that all represent this probability distribution. So that makes it relatively easy for the computer to use those simulated parameter values to estimate the probability distribution. So STAN is a programming language that makes use of MCMC algorithms. And it's based actually on C++ syntax rather than R syntax. And so learning STAN is beyond the scope of this course. Uh, if you take a more Bayesian dedicated course, you may learn STAN or possibly uh, a slightly older cousin like JAGS. Um, these are all MCMC based software that use slightly different syntax and different uh, sampling algorithms for the MCMC procedures. STAN is considered the most cutting edge right now that I'm aware of. Uh, so fortunately, the STAN developers have built an R interface that we can make use of. Uh, this is called RSTAN. And that's essentially a, a middle point, which has allowed for the development of several STAN-based R packages, including RSTAN ARM, uh, BRMS, Blavon, and Profit. Um, so RSTAN ARM and BRMS are both pretty straightforward and familiar. Blavon is more for doing latent variable analysis or SEM, so it's uh, a cousin of Levon. Uh, and Profit is something that I wasn't totally familiar with, but I was just looking up STAN packages, and apparently that's another one for doing time series forecasting. So the, the simplest STAN-based package is RSTAN-ARM. Uh, and this is the package we're going to use here. Just before diving in, I just wanted to note that there's an alternative called BRMS, um, which uh, is increasing in popularity. Um, so BRMS, the difference is that in RSTAN-ARM, we're doing everything that's based on pre-compiled STAN programs. Uh, whereas in BRMS, 
it's actually a sort of uh, a creative process where the the program tries to take your syntax and then write a completely new stand program. Uh, and this makes BRMS a lot more flexible, uh, but it also makes it a bit slower and less user friendly and a little bit more finicky. Um, it's easy, a little bit easier to break BRMS, but uh, it is increasing in popularity and a lot of the, the things that we're gonna do here, you can also do in BRMS very similarly. And so it's worth knowing about that. And you can do IRT models in BRMS is one of the other things that I wanted to mention. We can't do those in RSTEN ARM, but you can do them in BRMS. So using RSTEN ARM, uh, the syntax is really just adapted to mimic typical base R and LME4. Um, this is true for the simplest parts of BRMS as well, but we're again looking at RSTEN ARM. Um, so we really just adapted uh, functions by adding a stan prefix onto them. So stan LM is similar to LM, stan Elmer is similar to Elmer, and the actual formula syntax is almost exactly the same. Um, it's, it's really designed to be familiar to people who have been using base R and LM. So we can fit a Stan Elmer model exactly like we would fit an Elmer model. So you can see the only difference between this and a normal Elmer model is I've just tacked on this Stan here at the beginning, and I've also loaded up our Stan arm to start. Uh, I've also run this line of code, um, which is telling my computer to use, to do parallel processing essentially. It's saying use all available cores to run the chains. My computer has uh, four processor cores, so it can run all four chains parallel to speed things up a little bit, but it makes it hard for your computer to do other things while you are running the model. So this is what MCMC looks like in action. So once you run uh, an uh, RSTN ARM model, um, you'll, you'll see that the R viewer will tell you you can refresh it to update it and it'll start running these chains. And so this is essentially telling you how many draws it's made. So this is just a little snippet out of uh, one, one um, model that I ran. So you see we have four different chains here and it's telling me here we've gotten 1200 draws from the chain, here we've got 1400 draws or iterations from the chain. Um, and it also tells me when it switches from the warm up or the burn in to sampling. So here we see chain four hit number 1000 here and then it hit 1001 here and that's when it started actually sampling, left the, the burn in or warm up phase we talked about in the lecture. So what specific to Bayesian analysis is missing from this particular model? Um, and that besides some of the, the, the tuning hyperparameters or the tuning features about the chains that we talked about, what, what, what specific to conceptual Bayesian analysis is missing from this? The answer is the prior. So in our sin arm, the default priors are designed to be what they call weakly informative. And really purist Bayesians will tell you never use the term non-informative um, because they say there's no such thing as a non-informative prior. And they think that even frequentist analysis uses uh, a, some kind of prior, it's just a, a bad one. Um, so in concept, priors are an important part of Bayesian analysis, um, but there are several reasons and we may wanna use weakly informative priors as opposed to sort of principled or strongly informative priors. So why would we like weak priors? Um, the sort of most practical reason is that reviewers like them better. So if you use a strong prior, uh, the reviewer may see that and accuse you of biasing your model uh, with the prior unless you provide a really good reason for it. So um, if you say your prior is that the coefficient is gonna be two and that you're really sure that the coefficient is gonna be two, then you fit your model and the coefficient is two, that might look a little fishy, but if your prior is that the coefficient zero, but like you have really, really high uncertainty that that's true, and then it turns out the coefficient's two, that's a little bit more above board for reviewers when they read your work. Um, but that's more, again, more of a practical issue um, in terms of actual conceptual Bayesian analysis, your prior should be whatever your prior belief is. The other nice thing about priors, and this is another, sort of practical computational issue is that by design, they help prevent overfit, uh, weak priors in particular. Um, this is because weakly informative priors essentially tell you, say that I don't have a strong belief, um, therefore, if I have very little data, I don't wanna base my belief on that data too much. I wanna have something that's saying, okay, there's some uncertainty here, uh, and I still have some doubt about what my data is telling me. But if I have lots of data, I wanna let that data effectively drown out the prior and say uh, this prior is no longer really affecting the model at all. So if you don't have much data, if you have a weak prior that's you know, maybe centered around zero, 
you're sort of pulling your results towards zero a little bit just to like sort of hedge a little bit essentially. Um, in machine learning terminology, this is known as regularization, although in machine learning, the procedures for regularization, regularization are very different. So the default priors in Arsen Arm are normal 0, 2.5. Um, the way Dr. Chen described them is that they're on the standardized coefficients. This isn't technically quite right, but it's a way to think about it. Um, so since this is in standardized units, essentially saying that it expects for one standard deviation increase in X, we think there will be a 96% chance that Y will be between negative five and plus five uh, standard deviations. Um, so that's because our, we're specifying zero 2.5. So um, 2.5 is the standard deviation of our prior. So that means that um, we believe all observations will, will have a 96% chance of being within two standard deviations of our prior. So in this case, five. Um, this is a very wide prior and it allows regression coefficients to take on lots of possible values, but it's also centered at zero, which suggests you don't really have a prior belief about the direction of the relationship. It could be positive, it could be negative, who knows. So here's a visualization uh, for what the prior could look like. Um, this is uh, essentially on the x-axis, this is all possible values of a regression coefficient. And then on the y-axis is the, the density or the sort of probability that it'll take on one of those values. You can see this is pretty flat and wide. Um, you know, 10 is a really large standardized regression coefficient. Um, so uh, in, in principle, this is designed to not inform the model very much. It goes to, this goes from very small values to very high values, but has a little bit of more density in the middle. So it's saying you think it's more likely to be somewhat in the range of you know uh, neg negative two standard deviations to plus two standard deviations, but it's not it's not pulling it too strongly towards the middle unless you don't have a lot of data. So the defaults for the prior as an R stand arm are as follows: um, the intercept and the predictor slopes are all zero two point five with the, this auto scale equals true, which is what standardizes everything. Um, you have then you also have priors for the variances. Um, we're not going to worry too much about those. Uh, again, the auto scale equals two tell, tells Stan to do everything on the standardized scale. Um, the default changes to false if you set the prior explicitly. So don't forget that if you change your prior, you need to set auto scale equals true if you want it to be standardized. So the most sensible priors we can change are the predictor slopes. Um, you don't typically want to change the priors for the intercept or the error variance. Uh, and in fact, I would say you almost never want to do this unless you have a really good reason to. Um, so in terms of variances, just stop and think, what would a prior for a variance even look like? It's not really something our brains are programmed that well to do. Um, and the bottom line is that uh, the auto scaled variance and covariance uh, defaults are designed to just be very sensible. Um, there's not really much reason to change them. As for the intercept, uh, the reason we don't set a prior on the intercept is because the software actually internally centers and uncenters all variables. Uh, and this includes the outcome variable um, for the purpose of the intercept prior to, and for some other reasons. Um, but if you specify, but when you specify the prior, it's on the centered version of the data. So it really expects the average value for the outcome to be zero, no matter what. So uh, you, you usually want uh, to set the prior as zero. It still outputs it in the original unit, so it uncenters everything after the fact, but when you're setting the prior, it's on a centered version of the data. So this, the, the prior for the intercept should always be zero. You might change the uncertainty a little bit by changing the standard deviation, but you should probably should never set a, set a prior for the intercept that's not really zero in stand. Uh, so when we change the slopes, we have two options. We could change all of them at once to the same value, or we could change each one to a different prior. Um, we aren't restricted to the normal distribution. We can pick any other distribution we want in Stan. Um, there's a lot. There's uh, you know exponential, Cauchy, log, uh, uh, log normal. There's tons of distributions. Um, so we could we have lots of options, but normal is just an easy one for us to wrap our heads around. So we often use that. Uh, so. One thing is that we have to use the same distribution for every uh, slope. So we can only set the distribution once, but we can change the actual values and the parameters of the distribution for each uh, coefficient. 
So here I change each predictor slope to have a uh, prior of normal zero two. Um, so you see I set location equals zero and scale equals two uh, inside this normal call uh, for prior equals. And here I change them to be slightly more informative priors. Um, so I change them so that it's uh, normal negative one four um, for pain, normal one one for active, and normal zero zero point five for mstat. So what this is saying is that I think the coefficient for pain is more likely to be negative than positive since the mean is negative one, but I'm not really sure since the SD is four. So it's a pretty pretty wide standard deviation. On the other hand, I think the coefficient for active is probably positive, and I'm more confident of that because the standard deviation is smaller. So um, the standard deviation is only one here. So that's saying that I have much more confidence in my beliefs that the uh, coefficient for active is going to be positive, um, but there's still some chance it could be negative since the 96% of the values will fall between negative one and three for that. Uh, and then again, I'm saying that I think the coefficient for uh, mstat is zero. Um, and so I'm saying I don't really have a belief whether it's positive or negative. And in fact, I think it's very close to zero because I specified an even smaller standard deviation here. So when you specify these in R stand arm, note that you just concatenate the locations together and the scales together and you do them in order. So here I have negative one, one, zero for the, the scales. And then I have uh, four, one, 0 0.5 um, for the scales, uh, the other ones were the locations. So here we can sort of uh, visualize these custom priors that I set. So you can see that the prior for active um, is this red line. Um, so again, I'm pretty confident it's going to be a little bit positive, but there's still some chance it could be negative. Um, for mstat, I'm saying I'm very confident it's zero. This, this is a tight distribution right around zero. So there's not much chance I'm saying that it's outside of this range. And then pain, I'm saying I have a pretty, I still have a pretty wide prior on it. And I say I, think I, I have some belief it's negative, but I'm not very confident. Uh, finally, we can always check our priors with the prior summary function. Um, so this will allow us to understand exactly what priors we use. So uh, here um, I'm calling it back on the one that used the default priors. So uh, remember those are always uh, 0, 2.5, but those are on the, uh, the standardized scale. So the specified priors are what you, you passed. And then the adjusted prior, if you used auto scale, tells you what it actually used for the unstandardized prior.